charging your phone, or anything with a battery for that matter, is more difficult than you might actually think. Although power constantly flows through our walls, getting it there and making it actually useful takes more than just some wires. No matter what kind of energy you're using, with the exception of nuclear fission and fusion, your energy process starts at the sun. The sun fuses hydrogen into helium, making the atom lose a tiny bit of mass and turning that mass into energy that gets released as electromagnetic radiation or light. A tiny, tiny fraction of that light makes it to the surface of the earth where we're able to turn it into our most dominant need, energy. So what's the simplest way to plug in your phone? Well, that would be plugging it directly into a solar panel. Solar panels create a direct current, meaning that you can plug your cell phone directly into them or anything else battery powered for that matter. A solar panel essentially takes light from the sun and uses it to motivate electrons through silicon, creating a potential difference or voltage. With some simple wiring, you could plug USB directly into a solar panel and use it to charge whatever you want. We're gonna use that as our baseline. Our starting point is radiation from the sun and our ending point is direct current electricity. In the case of solar panels, there was only one change. It turns directly from light into that electromotive force, which is the same as voltage. So taking the prize for simplest DC generator, we have a solar cell. Now let's take some more steps of complexity and look at wind and water power. Although they use completely different methods of gathering the energy, the methods used to create direct current are essentially the same. You have something that's spinning and that spinning can run a generator. To get the thing spinning, we just wait for the earth to do its thing. As the sun heats up different areas of the earth different the wind patterns want to change, causing the wind turbines to be effective. In the same vein, sunlight turns water into water vapor, evaporating, causing clouds, causing rain, and inevitably causing power generation at a dam on a river. Once we have something spinning, we can then start to use a generator. But how do we get electrical current just by spinning something? Well, a generator in this sense relies on a magnetic field and a coil of wire that's rotated through that magnetic field. This is sort of what the coil of wire looked like. Mine is a USB cable that's been wound up, but you can use any single wire. Now let's imagine that we have a magnetic field going from my right to my left. The amount of magnetic field that's going through this coil at any given time is called the flux. The flux is at a maximum when the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and it's at a minimum when it's parallel. But flux is not what causes electricity to be generated. If that were the case, we would have an infinite energy source just by having a coil of wire steady in a magnetic field. What actually causes any changes in voltage are the changes in flux in the coil of wire. If I go from this position of maximum flux to this position of half flux, that change is what causes the voltage to appear on those ends of the wire. If we spin this coil, we have a constantly changing amount of flux, which results in a voltage that looks like a sine wave. That sine wave is what's called alternating current or AC power. That power is sent off to be transmitted by wires all sorts of places. But we still have a discrepancy. DC current is a constant voltage, whereas AC goes up and down and up and down. Although AC is great to transmit power over long distances, since the loss is minimal, we need DC to be able to charge our batteries. Thus, we want our voltage to look as close to a flat line as possible, not this crazy wavy sine wave. If we use AC power to run DC devices, then the devices are only functional when the current is positive. So we need a way to turn AC into DC or direct current. Enter the full wave rectifier. It's a device that turns this, this sine wave, into the absolute value of the sine wave so that the voltage is always positive. The key component of a full wave rectifier is a diode. It's something that allows current to go through one way but not the other. The rectifier uses four of these arranged in a specific pattern so that the voltage on the load is always positive. But we still have a problem. This graph is still really lumpy. We do have points where there is zero voltage. To fix that, we have to use what's called a capacitor. A capacitor stores electrical energy as electrical charge, because when opposite sides are oppositely charged, we can store more electrons or more lack of electrons in them. When you apply voltage to a capacitor, one side gets more electrons while one side gets them taken away. If you get the two sides closer together, they can store more energy because the charge of the other one allows you to pack them closer and closer together. You can add a capacitor to the circuit like this so that you can smooth the line out so it's always positive and not zero. If you crank up the capacitance, you can get something that is even smoother than that, which is how we can approximate DC current with AC power. Let's count our steps now. For wind power, we have light turning to heat, 
heat turning to movement of wind, that movement of wind turning to rotational energy of the wind turbine. That rotational energy turns a generator, which makes AC, and the AC gets turned to DC with rectification. That's five steps, four more than with the solar panel. I know that AC and DC are technically the same type of energy, but I'm counting the transition between them as a step. With hydropower, we have even more steps. Light turns to heat, the heat evaporates the water, causing gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy comes down and turns the rotational. The rotational turns the generator, which makes AC, and AC turns into DC, so six steps. Looking at another green option, we have controlled nuclear fission, which we can also use to run a generator. The energy given off as heat is essentially the same as that given off by the sun, which is running a steam turbine, which causes rotational energy, which turns a generator, makes AC current, and then makes DC current. That's the same number of steps as a wind turbine, since we have the original nuclear potential energy turning into that rotational energy from the heat. Moving on to our unsustainable fuel sources, we have all of our fossil fuels, which came from the sun in the first place. We burn these to create the same heat is nuclear fuel with a steam turbine, but we end up pumping a lot of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere as a result. That chemical potential energy started as sunlight when plants photosynthesized it to create fuel for themselves and for other animals. All that life decomposed over time after being buried by rock into oil. That process started millions of years ago, so we can't keep burning fossil fuels because we can't make any more of them. There's a reason they're called fossil fuels. The key word is fossil. As for our number of steps, we have sunlight going into plants, which are usually eaten by animals. Then we have several million years of decomposition and turning those animals that died into fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels are found and burned for heat. That heat turns into rotational energy, which is used to power an AC generator, which is rectified and turned into a DC current to charge your phone. Although this process has a comparable number of steps, it takes a considerably longer amount of time, which is why we can't continue to use fossil fuels at the rate we are right now. If you have any questions for me, drop them down in the comments. And if you don't, then summarize what you learned today in a comment so you remember it better. That's all I have for you today. So until next time, thanks for watching.